Here's the funny thing about change. Have you ever gone through a bad change? Have you ever gone through a crappy change? Have you ever been a part of an organization that implemented a new software package and it sucked? Not the software package, but the implementation of the change. Or maybe a new organizational structure. It sucked. Well, not necessarily the organizational structure, but the implementation of the change. How about in a community? Have you ever been in a neighborhood or in a, in a town or even a city where we're going to make some changes and it was a good idea, but the implementation was so poor that the idea died on arrival. D-O-A, dead on arrival. Why? Not because the idea was poor, but because implementation stunk. I would suggest to you, high-flying concepts, well-intended strategies, built by good-hearted, well-meaning, hard-working people, so that high-flying, needs some landing gear. Progress and change are indelibly intertwined. There can be no progress without change. Listen, progress and change are indelibly intertwined. There can be no progress without change. If you always do what you always done, you always get what you always got. So what do we know? We know that we have to be effective at changing things, especially in these times of transformation. We've talked about a personal process for changing yourself, and now let's talk about a, a, a process for implementing change within a group, organization, even town. I call it mastering the power of change. There is a power behind change. All progress is linked to changing. But how do you do it? Now, the process that I'm going to work through, the system that I'm going to work through today, assumes that the decision to change has been made. We're, this isn't about how do you decide what you're going to change and how you're going to change it. That's not it. The decision has been made. This is about implementation. This is a system for implementation. In other words, in case of change, clack, break glass. And then you pull out the system and apply it. And over a period of time, the stakeholders will get used to following the system. Sometimes people are adverse, change adverse, because they want a sense of safety and security. A system for changing provides safety and security. Not that they're excited about the change, but at least they have some control of how it is implemented. Self-determination. Let the people closest to the issues have some say in how we do things. They may not have a say in what we're changing, but they certainly can have a say in the how. That gives them a sense of safety, security, self-reliance, self-determination that all serves you well when we talk about building trust. All right, let's jump into it. Hopefully you've printed out your handout. Let's jump into it. First, we understand the truism that all change is driven by a vision. You must have a vision. You must ha be able to explain to somebody why. Why are we making this change? Look at what it says here. People will understand the rationale behind the vision and will anticipate change even if they do not necessarily support the change. The greater to extent to which the vision is shared and fully supported, the easier it is to create an environment which seeks to move forward into the future. In other words, if I can explain to somebody the relevance, the impact, and the, how it increases our quality, I can make my case for the change. If you can't do that, stop. <laughs> Have you ever cleaned up a messy change? Have, are you even still today dealing with the residue of bad change? Take an extra week, take an extra two weeks to talk through the change so that you can create that vision and be able to explain it to somebody so they have a greater degree of buy-in. All change must be driven by a solid vision. So the, so the next step is forming a change team, a change team. Now, a change team, I would suggest, is important because it provides you an opportunity to introduce the change as quickly as possible, as smoothly as possible, and maximize the acceptance to the wider stakeholder group. Now, why is that? A couple of reasons. Let's look at the interpersonal dynamics. First of all, it can be perceived that it's the leader's change. By forming a change team, you now have influence with people that you may not have had influence with. In other words, those individuals on the change team may have greater influence amongst the stakeholders than you do and greater trust. Secondly, 
It allows you to have your ear to the rail. Your ear to the rail. You have unfiltered information because you have individuals from each of the various stakeholder groups or the, the one large stakeholder group. They can give you insight and wisdom unfiltered because they're from the group. It also provides you greater depth of operational knowledge, experience, and expertise. They're closer to the issues. They can give you some insight and wisdom on implementation and how to best go about it. In addition to that, they can provide you a, a, a communication conduits that you may not have. Everybody tells the boss, it's going fine. But they can provide you that conduit directly to get the solid information you need to make good decisions. So let's unpack the change team. I would say it's anywhere from three to seven people, depending on the size of your group and depending on the severity or the intensity of the change that's in play. Before we can talk about forming the change team, we've got to take a good hard look about how people react to change. I would suggest to you there's five reactions to change. Now, I'm not trying to put anybody in a box. We're not trying to pigeonhole anybody. But I think it's in your best interest to get it some kind of a sense on how people are going to react to change. So these five categories, I think, are important to think through. And in addition, please keep in mind that all of us in different times in our life and in different roles that we play may have a different reaction to change. First, the early riser. This is the individual that's just excited about changing things. Oh, I just love change. Change my hair color, rearrange the furniture. I love change. Early risers. They're good with any change. Fact is, they welcome change. Sometimes they create chaos and change just because they like it so much. Early riser. Then, the early adapters. They like change. They're fine with change but they would like to have a little bit of an explanation. That goes back to that vision commentary I made a moment ago. They want to know why, and then they're on board. Then you have the crowd. You could also put next to that sheeple, sheep people, the crowd. Now, they're not good or bad, right or wrong, but they'll kind of go whichever way the wind is blowing. If the wind is blowing negative, they'll go negative. If the wind is blowing positive, they'll go positive. They're the crowd, the silent majority. Then you have the legitimizer. Now, here's the funny thing about the legitimizer. They can come across being a resistor, but they're not a resistor. You see, they're a legitimizer because they get their legitimacy from the crowd. They say and do what the crowd wants to say and wants to do, but doesn't. They have legitimacy with the crowd because they are the mouthpiece. They are the action of the crowd. Now here's the other funny thing about a legitimizer. They're asking questions and really want answers. It's not because they're negative. It's because they care, oftentimes. And so they ask intense questions and they ask detailed questions. That can come across as being resistant, but not really. If you can sway the legitimizer, then you probably get the crowd to follow. And then finally, the resistor. This is the individual that's against. Now, before you judge them, they may be against the change because they're going through a divorce at home and the only stable thing in their life was the workplace and now you're talking about changing that. It's important to recognize that we all at some point or another in our lives have been resistant to change. So before you condemn them, think it through a little bit. Now, notice those five categories. The first one's on board with change. The second one's on board with change if you just give them some, I, some sound uh, reasoning behind it. The third one is just going to go with whichever the flow is. The fourth one you're going to have to work through and the fifth one is probably going to be resistant irregardless, regardless of what you attempted to do. Here's the funny thing. All I've got to do is focus my energy on probably legitimizer. The rest of the people I can get on board. What's your point, Ian? My point is that you have a finite amount of time, energy, and effort. So I've got to be more laser-like in my focus, sitting down and thinking through how people will react to change would behoove you in the long run so you can take the limited time and energy that you have and apply it appropriately. So when forming the change team, 
based on those five categories, should I have all early risers on my change team? No. Should I have all early adopters? No. I should have a mix. Now, I don't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily put a resistor on there, but I would have a legitimizer or two on there, depending on the size of your group, so that your change team is perceived to be legitimate. So I've, I go and I ask these individuals to be on board. Now, how do you ask them? You say, as all of you know, we're implementing this change. It may not be a popular change, but we're implementing it nonetheless. And I need your help to make the ride as smooth as possible. Now, be clear with them and say, we're, we're not debating whether we're changing or not. That's already been decided. But I would like your help to make it as smooth as possible. Most reasonable people will say, I will help you with that or I'll help us with that. The change team gives you a, then a solid base for implementation. It broadens your influence and it gives you clear conduits of communication that can help you make effective decisions as you go through the implementation process. Additionally, you want to think through as many of the stakeholders as you can and how people will react to change so that you have a better sense of where you might have to focus your energies through the implementation process. All right, now that you have the, the change team in place, let's talk about the strategies for change. The first thing you have to talk about with the, the, uh, the first thing you have to think through, the first things that you have to think through as after you form the change team is, what's the timeline we have for change? Is this thing immediate, like it's come down the pipe hard and we gotta do it right now? Or do we have some time for testing and, and, and talking and training and the like? Then, to what degree will people be involved in the change process? Are they going to be robots and here's how it's lined out? Or are we going to be able to get some feedback? In a moment, we'll talk about how some simple things that we can do to always get them involved to some degree. And then ask yourself this. Are there some learnings from previous change that we can gain some insight from to make this change a little bit easier and a little bit smoother? Once you've had that dialogue with your change team and those things are clarified, once you've had that dialogue and those things are clarified, then it's time for the implementation. The first thing you're going to do when you sit down with that change team after that dialogue is this. Start to put together a timeline for change. Here's the simplicity of the question to the change team. You just say to them, you say, guys, what are all the things that we'd have to do for this change to work? Because they have operational knowledge, because they have vocational insight, because they have expertise out in whatever they do, they're going to be able to give you some clarity. They're going to be able to give you some wisdom. They're going to be able to say, well, if we're really going to do this change, we better do this, 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 and this. I call that the task list. You're going to create a task list. And it's going to be created by the people, right? Create a task list created by the people. Then you're going to have this following discussion. Well, what's the timeline that we would have to follow to, to do those things? What's the timeline? And you will have created now a timeline for the implementation of change. But again, it will be, be created by the people. So first question is, what is everything we'll have to do to make this go? To get from where we're at today to the change. And then you create a timeline. You take those two things and you have a plan. But then you take the task list and the timeline and you send it all out to all the stakeholders. You take the timeline and the task list and you send it out to all the stakeholders and you share it with them. Here's what we plan to do. And you get their feedback. I don't have time to do that. You know what? Even if you took a day, it's in your best interest. Now remember, they're not complaining about the change and you're clear about that. Guys, we're changing. What I'm giving you an opportunity to do is have some say in how we do it. Self-determination giving them a sense of safety and security by having at least some control. They look at the timeline, they look at the task list, and you give them an opportunity to give feedback. And you take that feedback and you adjust the plan accordingly. Now, if their feedback is, I don't like it, that's not part of the discussion. <laughs> if you don't like this, what do you think we need to do? We're changing. So, but we need your insight and wisdom to make it as smooth as possible. So look at what you've done here. You've with a group, a small group of stakeholders built a task list and a timeline. 
then you've shared it with the larger group. And you've said to that larger group, what adjustments would you make? Is this sound? All of a sudden, whose plan is this now? It's their plan. They can't yell at us and me as the leader because I had a crappy plan. They had ample opportunity to, have in, to give insight and wisdom to the plan as a whole. Then what do we do? Then we've taken that initial plan, which has now been revised, and we implement. The other thing that it does is gives them clarity of what exactly is going to happen because they've had a say in building it, the how. They've helped build the how. Now, once you begin the implementation, we start day one. That's when your change team becomes very, very critical because they're out in the field. They've got the task list. They've got the timeline. I would then meet regularly with the change team to have a how's it going conversation. Depending on the intensity of the change, you may have that conversation every day. But let's just say it's a reasonable change and you're having that conversation once a week or once every two weeks. That conversation goes as simple as this. How's it going? Bob, how's it going in your area? Joe, how's it going in your area? Larry, Moe, Curly, Jane, and, and Barbara, how's it going? It's going great, going great, going great. Not so great. Hmm, not so great. Now, if you have a smaller organization, obviously this is a more compact conversation because maybe your change team is the whole stakeholder group, right? But the concept still holds true. So somebody says it's not going so well. You're going to then ask some clarifying questions so that you can get to the root cause of the challenge. The first thing you're going to ask is, well, is the issue everybody or one or two people? Oh, it's everybody. Nobody's getting it. What does that tell me? That tells me we've got some training issues or we've got some procedural issues. So I go back to the task list and the timeline and see for that specific stakeholder group is there some challenges in the system or in the training. No, it's just Bob. Bob is really causing a problem. Is it group or is it individual? If it's group, do as I just described. If it's one person, then I would suggest the following strategy. I'd say to the person, on the change team who's bringing me the information, what's going on with Bob? They're against it. Bob's against it. He's digging his heels in the ground. You know how Bob can be. Now you've got to ask yourself a question. Am I going to take time and energy to address Bob or do I have enough momentum in the change that Bob seems to everyone else to be an unreasonable person, a banging gong in the wilderness? No, Bob can gum up the works. He's got a lot of influence. He's a legitimizer. Then I would suggest the next step. The next step would be to have whoever on the change team has the best relationship with Bob go have a conversation with Bob. Well, why don't I as the leader go have a conversation with them? Because if you as a leader go and have the conversation with them and nothing gets better, you have no fallback. So the first step is send someone who has the best relationship with them that's involved in the change team to go have a conversation, a one-on-one -on -one conversation. That conversation is pretty simple. It goes like this. Bob, what's going on? <laughs> Why are you so against this? Under what conditions could you support this change? Well, I think we should do this and this and this. Okay, we could do that. Boom. You get Bob on board through a simple conversation. Or how about if it turns out like this? Under no conditions. You know, attitudinally they say, attitudinally, they may not verbalize it, but attitudinally they say, you know what, I'm going to gum up the works no matter what. I'm going to dig my heels in the ground. They screwed me over before and I'm going to mess this up. Then the next question is, okay, Bob, under what conditions will you just keep your mouth shut? <laughs> now, you might not say it like that, but that's where you got to get to. You got to get to the place where you understand attitudinally, why is Bob doing this? Does he feel like he was shortchanged in the past? Does he feel like the, 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 what's being done is, is against his principles and values? Or did he get passed over for the last promotion? What's his root intent? And then you can apply the appropriate strategy. So let's, let's, find, let's say that he is just against, he's a resistor no matter what. And you've determined that you do not have enough momentum to make him seem like a banging gong. That's when you step in as the leader and have a direct conversation with Bob. And that conversation goes something like this. Bob, I understand that you're against the change for this, 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 and this. 
regrettably, Bob, we're changing. We're changing. We had gave you an opportunity to see the timeline and the task list. You had your opportunity to give feedback. You chose not to. It's reasonable for us to request for you to get on board with this change and follow the policies and procedures that we put into place. You have that conversation one-on-one. -on -one. You have it in your office. You sit and chat with them. And you have the same conversation that you, the other person had, which is under what conditions. So that by the end of the conversation, Bob is clear that we're changing and here's the process that we're going to follow. If Bob has been offended or rudely treated in the past, it's okay to apologize. I'm sorry that those things occurred. I'm sorry that you feel this way. I'm sorry that you're bitter. I'm sorry for that. Unfortunately, we're changing. <laughs> so it, you can be empathetic. You can even apologize, but you're clear that we're changing. So the change team helps you know about Bob, learn about Bob. It helps you understand whether it's a systemic group issue that needs retraining or the changing of policy and procedure for the implementation of the change to occur, or is it an individual? And then if it is an individual, it provides you a reasonable relation-based strategy to get Bob on board or at least get Bob to comply because that's really all you care about. Over the implementation of the change, you utilize the change team to be the conduit of communication to keep you in touch with everything that's going on so that you can make tactical decisions based on the overall strategy and outcomes. All right, then, the review. The review. Once the change has occurred, a couple of things, in my opinion, have to happen. One, we have to check and see if the change actually worked. How many times have you been involved in a change and we never reported back to the people to let them know that either the change was successful, well done, or the change did not have the intended outcome? See, people want to know. So every time you do a change, just make sure you report back. It'll make the next change a lot easier. So we report back. So we do an analysis, an evaluation. Did the change really meet our desired outcomes? Then we do an evaluation of how did we do at changing? How did we do at changing? The more nimble an organization can be, the better they can be at changing, the, the better opportunity they have to not only sustain but to thrive in times of transformation. So you sit down with the change team and you say, how did we do? Wow, we could have done this better, we could have done that better, we could have done this better, we could have done that better. You write it all down, you put it in the book called Changing Things, and you put it on the shelf for the next time you change. So you pull it back down, as we discussed at the beginning of the process, and you open it up and say, the last time we changed, this is what went well, this is what didn't, so the next change is smoother and easier. And all of a sudden, what have you created? You've created an adapting organization, a learning organization, and an organization that can change nimbly and quickly. So the review is twofold. Was the thing that we wanted to change, is it actually work? And you report back. And then secondly, how did we do it changing? Final thought to summarize. It is completely unrealistic to think that 100% of your stakeholders will get on board with the change. That's not what you're trying to do. So don't strive for that because of the five reactions to change. You're going to have some resistors no matter what. Not saying they're bad people, but they're going to resist for whatever reason. What you're trying to do is have a, as smooth and as quick, quickly as possible, as smooth as possible and as quickly as possible, implementing the necessary change. Your change team assists you with that. Your change team is the implementation tool that will get greater stakeholder buy-in, build a more effective plan, and ensure that the goals and outcomes are met. And more importantly, that there's a process that people can take comfort, safety, and security in. They may not be able to have comfort and security in this change because they don't like it, but at least they can have some level of self-determination. What is the net effect? The net effect is change will be smoother and easier, and more importantly, I think, that people know, in case of change, break glass. And then they fall into line of how we implement change. Master the power of this thing called change. Thanks a lot, everybody. Talk to you soon.